Glad to see you all here, so I don't feel as though I'm speaking to a post. On behalf of the National Coffee Association of the United States of America, it is my distinct honor to be with you here today. I must first thank Manny Shin and the Organizing Committee for designing an outstanding program and for their gracious hospitality. And extend my gratitude to each of you here that point. To each of you here at the World Coffee Leaders Forum, who have made evident by your attendance and steadfast commitment to the coffee industry. Korea has a surprising history with coffee. In 1895, when Queen Min was assassinated, King Dojong and his son, the Crown Prince, became virtual prisoners in their own palace. The next year, the King and Crown Prince disguised as court women, were carried out of the palace in enclosed chairs and made their escape to the Russian consulate. According to many historians, it was during that 13th month stay that King Gojong, and by extension Korea, was introduced to the rich taste of coffee. Gojong is said to have enjoyed his coffee black, sweetened only with a single cube of sugar. I'm guessing that Back then, half cat, no full lattes were hardly available. Although Korean's consumption of coffee has certainly, there is certainly a little less dramatic today, it holds firm to its royal introduction. Coffee here is perhaps more special than it is anywhere in the world. And its rich history, combined with the innate, trend-setting nation that Korea has become, has resulted true coffee innovation. Hand drips, cold brew, roasted in house. The thousands of coffee shops spread across the soul make it clear that the coffee business here is as much about quality as it is about quantity. Baristas at limited edition cafe, for instance, appear as star chefs cooking up signature drinks. And according to a recent New York Times essay, those searching for a real coffee culture should depart Tokyo and Kyoto and head for Korea. Since starting a coffee house in Korea is the new gold rush. From what I've heard, you're just as likely to smell the aroma of coffee as you are to catch the fragrance of kimchi on the streets of Seoul. Nearly one in every two buildings boasts a coffee shop. As home to the third largest number of Starbucks active in the United States and Japan, Korea has tenfold the coffee shops it had in 2006. The spark was lit by Starbucks, which entered the market in 1999, and led the charge of making Korea the 11th largest coffee market in the world. So much so, the cafe and sales jumped to $2.2 billion in the last year a tremendous feat for a relatively new market. So what does this mean for Korea? It means that you indeed have a very unique opportunity in the world today. Your infrastructure is booming. The desire of consumers ever increasing. And if you look at the trends in the United States and elsewhere, you'll see a clear roadmap for Korea's bright and busy future in the coffee industry. The beauty of coffee is that it's a great connector. It's a product farm by those who cultivate the land, reinforcing our connection to sustainability. It's a product sharing between co-workers and friends, <coughs> with families, and on first dates. It's found in a coffee house for conversation, not television, is king. And discussions about love, politics, religion and the world flow freely. Coffee brings us together as a world, from production to exploitation, from roaster to retail, all having a vital role in delivering the beans that are transformed into a rich cup of coffee. With the great commodity that coffee is, there's opportunity and plenty of it. For growing the coffee business can mean extraordinary things for Korea. And at your request, I'm pleased 
this morning to share with you three ways the United States, the world's largest coffee consumer, has managed to grow. Our organization, the National Coffee Association, is one of the first trade organizations in the United States and has provided research and advocacy for over 100 years. Our ability to educate, to mobilize and connect growers, roasters, and retailers creates a family of protection for America's most prized beverage. Although I'm biased as head of the organization, I would maintain that it is vital for any country to have a single, highly organized association to advocate on behalf of coffee. The National Coffee Association has led the charge on everything from education to legislation, and we consistently focus on three paramount aspects of the coffee business to ensure that our industry flourishes. Information, relationship building, and legislative action. Information, to understand how and why consumers are drinking coffee, to mark trends and predict market changes. These are all vital to the ability to market coffee and grow the industry worldwide. Since 1950, the National Coffee Association has commissioned an annual survey of Americans on their consumption habits and practices. For instance, we know now that people in the Western U.S. drink less traditional coffee and more gourmet coffee, while the Eastern U.S. is tied to the traditional cups of coffee. We know that in 2012, the average consumer drank 3.2 cups of coffee per day. We also know that the current barriers to consumption are myths regarding health risks, and that when consumers hear positive messages about coffee and health, they're apt to drink more coffee. And finally, aside from demographics and types of consumption, we can, most importantly, track the increase or decreases in the amount of coffee consumed each and every year the studies they've conducted. Additionally, through another smaller research project by the Specialty Coffee Association of America, the industry has begun to understand that our customers' needs are not singular, but varied. And that consumers are now likely to want a different coffee experience at different times of the day. Meaning, a consumer may drink a cup of coffee in the morning as a caffeine delivery system. In the afternoon, they might be looking for that great tasting cup. And in the evening, they might very well be seeking out a phenomenal coffee experience, a once-in-a-lifetime experience with someone they love, sipping a truly unique coffee in an environment that is out of this world. Why is this information and these numbers so important? Because they give us, as an association, a platform for which to educate. When the media wants answers, when Congress or local governments are considering legislation and regulation, and when coffee growers, roasters, and retailers want to know how and where people are consuming coffee, the National Coffee Association provides a cohesive and informed voice for our commodity. <clears throat> Having this collective voice is especially essential for a market like Korea, where growth has come and continues to come very quickly. Information, therefore, has become our most useful tool in the growth of our product worldwide. Consider this snapshot. In 2012, we know that in America, coffee is the most consumed beverage after water. Half of all cups consumed in the United States are gourmet. We know there is a particularly large increase in consumption among the younger consumers and that they are more likely to use a single cup system or espresso machine or purchase a ready-to-drink beverage than they are to be drip brewing at home. This speaks volumes to our youth market potential. Where many in the U.S. thought the single cup brewer would never gain traction, we've now seen the single cup brewing system skyrocket, making it the second most popular brewing system after drip coffee. Ownership of single cup systems among coffee drinkers 
has jumped from 1% in 2005 to 10% this year. This alerts us to the fact that convenience and variety are supremely important and that need to be sacrificed. Young consumers want their coffee easily available and desire the same flavors and options at home that they can get at the cafe. Korea's market, steeped in instant coffee, would appear to reflect a similar preference for convenience and variety. That could mean, unlike many consumers in emerging markets who generally go from instant coffee to a coffee shop culture to brewing roasted raw at home, Korean consumers, consumers may very well skip the brewing roasted raw at home and go straight to the single cup system, which gives them ease, convenience, and the variety they want. This possibility could have a profound impact on business strategies and product planning for the Korean coffee industry. This specific understanding of what drives consumption and the consistent education of your industry about trends and forecasts is the first step in creating a solid coffee economy. Second, and perhaps most simply, any country committed to this commodity must be committed to building relationships around the globe. As I mentioned at the outset, coffee is a great connector, bringing dozens of countries and supply chain participants together day in and day out. The ability to create and maintain relationships globally is perhaps the only thing that can expand your coffee industry in the long term. This is especially important when it comes to the farmer. Farmers are the core of the coffee business. They're a group with whom you need to communicate. They go to crops, they understand how and why supply may serve to drop. They can forecast changes and difficulties. And most of all, through your relationships, you can foster sustainable practices that will ensure the production of coffee happens in a way that will guarantee future life across for generations to come. There is also another fundamental benefit to building these relationships with growers, and that is the rich story of coffee. What is remarkable about Korea is that your coffee culture has begun to be coffee like a fine wine. There is a history, a flavor, a journey from the bean, and Koreans appreciate that journey. Your relationships with the global farming community not only put you in a better position to get coffee in a marketplace that will surely become more competitive, but they increase your ability to sell coffee. For the retail or roaster who can tell a story about a far off place, Understanding the family who grew the tree and cultivated the flavors and the intricacies of the farm on which it is planted and stands. All translate to the heightened experience for the consumer that goes far beyond any water in its environment. Today, people want to feel connected to the world and the coffee store, or wherever it may be, and your relationships are the cornerstone of that experience. One final thought on relationships, particularly with farmers. Your communication with them ensures that they are aware of the restrictions and regulations in your country that may arise from government agencies. And this is an important aspect of my third suggestion, the management of government intervention. Make no mistake, Government regulation of an industry is a good thing, particularly today when the national security of many countries is at risk. The steps governments take to monitor imports are essential. Likewise, the domestic regulation of products helps consumer confidence, assuring that every American, and in my case, that the food they eat and the coffee they drink is safe. The problem arises when these regulations start to become silly, hampering the growth of an industry and making it impossible for companies, large and small, to 
to operate successfully. At the National Coffee Association, we are a beacon of free enterprise and hold tight to the belief that competition is good and minimal regulations of foster and even better business environment. As the industry's legislative representative, we have taken on hundreds of regulatory battles, including most recently a Proposition 65 in the state of California. Under this law, the state of California requires that companies warn consumers when trace amounts of more than 800 chemicals are deemed, that the state has deemed harmful to health, are in products. Of course, this list is often based on what we would consider faulty or weak science. Indeed, the U.S. coffee industry has been sued in California for the presence of acrylamide coffee. Like other informed substances, acrylamide occurs naturally when coffee is roasted, just as it does in many other products, like bacon or potatoes. But in such trace amounts, they can only be detected because of advanced scientific methodologies. These types of frivolous regulations create false alarm scenarios in the United States, meaning consumers will then pay less attention to genuine health and safety issues that may benefit from regulation. This relates to Korea in a very real way. Because of the media coverage regarding Proposition 65, Europe and possibly Japan are now taking a serious look at regulations that could potentially harm the coffee industry in these countries, opening the door to unnecessary legislation across the globe. Our message is consistently in a simple way. Fight unnecessary regulations and let business grow with minimal truth. In Korea, this is true for the move to control franchise operators in Seoul by setting a minimum distance requirement between stores. Again, these types of restrictions are always best left to companies themselves, rather than being instituted by governments or watchdog groups who sometimes pass too many rules and thereby can suffocate a beautiful emerging enterprise like Korean coffee. Although the United States remains the world's largest consumer of coffee, and often sets an example for emerging countries. There are also many extraordinary steps taken by other countries to grow their own coffee consumption and to build the coffee culture. When we look at Asia, we see a vibrant tourism industry and millions of visitors from around the globe demanding a rich cup of coffee. We also see Asian coffee producing nations increasing the availability of domestic and imported specialty coffee for their consumers. Take India, which, by the way, is laying claim of, along with Ethiopia as the birthplace of coffee. They're focusing on increasing domestic consumption with an expectation of growing their 80,000 ton domestic consumption market at about 10% per year. Like Korea, India has also experienced a real boom and explosion of coffee shops spreading from India's coffee light south to the more tea-oriented north. The fact is, India has become extremely pro-coffee, with few restrictions on foreign companies and strong government support for the coffee sector. We see a real coffee culture developing in Thailand as well. Coffee shop chains are going fast, consumption is increasing, but that growth very well be stifled by the relatively high cost of imported coffee and high import tariffs on equipment. And China could very well redefine what competition for quality beans really means. As you all know, there's an increasing affluence in China with a yearning to Western ideals. China's demand for coffee is estimated to be growing at about 10% per year, largely because of the surge of coffee shops in the coastal cities. Indeed, Indonesia, a country strong and exporting, but one that is late behind in domestic consumption, we're seeing an increasing number of traditional coffee shops, consistent with the increasing standard of living and the lifestyle of the younger generation. Here, retailers have been taken to the streets 
And they produced what are called the mobile, the mobile coffee shop, with people riding bicycles from place to place selling coffee. Something that I can assure you, nobody who values his life would dare try it in a place like New York City, especially considering cab drivers. Russia's National Coffee Association is so well organized that although the country isn't even a member of the International Coffee Organization, or ICO, they have been asked to serve on ICO's private sector consultative board. Again, underscoring the need for a strong national organization in every country that is serious about building a solid coffee infrastructure. In France, they recognize that the younger generation leans towards convenience, and they're delivering a variety of differentiated products for this new generation, similar to what we're experiencing in the United States. But the point is, in every corner of the world, innovations in coffee can be heard, shared, and replicated. And it's education to innovation, relationship building, and understanding the difference between helpful and hurtful regulatory processes that can take these innovations and turn them to robust growth. The most important of these three are the relationships. The coffee business is the relationship business. In tough times and in bad, the people throughout the global supply chain are essential. The producers are our partners in business and farmers are king. With strong relationships, you can collect the intelligence that, that can assist you with blends and supply information that enables you to be an active part of the social, economic, and environmental solutions to global growth. Here in Korea, you have mastered a tremendous need. The coffee culture is growing perhaps faster than any other segment of Korean society. And now the next step, the most important step, is to manage that growth by crafting a strong association, collecting vital information, keeping a watchful eye on over-regulation, and for Korea now to Asia globally and become a global part of the international conversation. Because here's the thing, and you'll pardon my plain speak, but Korea, as we say in the US, is cool. You are at the forefront of innovation in so many areas, and one only has to walk down the streets of Seoul to see how you are taking the traditional coffee house, as well as the coffee chain experience, to a whole new level. From Dunkin' Donuts, aroma releasers on buses, to the $20 specialty coffee for installment across the city, you are at the forefront of many extraordinary experiences. And with the energy and creativity that you have, I have no doubt you can move the Korean coffee industry to the very top tier of global consumption. For my part, I hope I've been able to provide you with a simple map, a compass as to how you can grow your industry smartly and efficiently, while gaining the respect and gratitude of the worldwide coffee community. As the great American statesman, Oliver Wendell Holmes, was famous for saying, the morning cup of coffee has an exhilaration about it, which the cheering influence of afternoon tea cannot be expected to reproduce. The fact is, coffee exhilarates and inspires us all, whether a consumer, retailer, or producer. And I fully expect that Korea will lead the charge of global inspiration and consumption in the very near future. I wish you all the greatest success in that pursuit. Thank you. 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 그 유니언하게 만들 수 있는 그 좋은 어떤 방법이나 제안 같은 게 한국에 해주실 수 있다라고 하면 그런 말씀 한 마디 부탁드리겠습니다. 
In the United States, there are actually a few coffee associations. And in the US, there was at one time one association. Uh, it was the National Coffee Association, and quite frankly, decades ago, probably back in the 60s and 70s, uh, I, I think the association stopped listening to its members. And the members are the people that own the association. So what happened then was a group of members, and, and there were other influencing factors, but basically a group of members, of course, went out and created their own association. That, that is a, quite an important association today, um, the Specialty Coffee Association of America. But I firmly still believe that any industry, the coffee industry included, is much better served by one strong, united organization <coughs> in each country. In the United States, we don't look at it as a Colombian coffee industry and a European coffee industry and a U.S. industry. In fact, we look at it really as one global coffee community. And I think that uh, with the National Coffee Association, you know, we manage another association as well called the Green Coffee Association. What we do, and we've looked at merging and had discussions with various associations about combining associations, I think what we do in the meantime is really work very hard to coordinate amongst the associations. The members that belong to the NCA are the same people that belong to the SCA and they're the same people that belong to the Green Coffee Association. And quite frankly, our collective members don't want to be paying all of us to do the same thing. So we meet uh, regularly with the other associations. We look to where we can create unity. We look to where we can create courses and, and do joint programming. At the same time, we look very hard to ensure that we don't replicate uh, programs. The National Coffee Association focuses more on government affairs, issues management, public relations, market research, and we do some education. Um, so from a Korean standpoint, I think it's important that you recognize everybody is in this together. That the associations put aside with their personalities and sit down and talk about what can be done to strengthen the community here. And it, it is a long road, I think, uh, and I'm not very familiar with the individual uh, associations. But I think it's very important that in which association may be larger or smaller, who they represent. I think it's important for people to take off their hats that they wear when they're sitting at their own association board meetings, put on the hat of the Korean coffee community, and work together and consolidate. So it is just this is one industry, and if we don't work together, you'll find that the Korean coffee community and the culture won't go where it could. You know, in my opinion, the competition isn't different coffee companies or different sectors of the industry. Our competition is other beverages. If we want to prevail against that comp uh, competition, we must come together. And I would encourage you uh, to do that here. Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll see you again today. Actually, my question is that New York, New York, I know you're coming from New York City, right? So uh, New York is a center of from uh, the reading and the creative trends, uh, in the most industry, fashion, everything. But it seems to me coffee is not the way. Maybe coffee is just more West Coast, the Seattle, San Francisco, Chicago. Even. I understand the uh, intelligence is opening coffee, coffee shop in New York. So why New York is late? Leading the uh, coffee industry and innovation, my first question. Second one is Korea has been importing coffee. Now we are still huge in uh, jump up in growth in, in uh, quality and everything. Now Korean com coffee brands is going to expand you know, outside of Korea in China or what? I, I know Coffee Venet is Korean franchise brand that opened shop recently in New York City. Do you think it's possible that will they succeed or not? Or my other question is that what about success factors if Korean brands move into New York companies, the service, or even intelligence? Yeah, that's my implication. Well, you must be from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be a New Yorker, you wouldn't say San Francisco is leaking coffee. It really depends who you talk to. Um, I think maybe in New York, we're more focused on the clothes and design and not coffee. Uh, but there's a very vibrant coffee culture in New York. And as I mentioned when I spoke, the specialty 
uh, segment, if you will, uh, really took off in the West Coast. But I would have to say that, you know, certainly where I live in New York City, it's a very vibrant culture. I think that, I forgot your second question, you go back and ask that. I think it was, it was your seventh or eighth question um, had to do with what does one have to do to compete in the marketplace in New York City. I think that one has to, what one has to do to compete in any city, in the food and beverage sector, if you will, coffee or, or food, restaurants and cafes, is to provide a great tasting product and deliver 10% better service than your toughest competitor. You know, coffee is a people business, and people want to go in and just have a wonderful experience, and that's delivered by people. What one must do is create a strong brand, and a brand is not a logo, a brand is the emotional connection that one has between the product and, and, the, uh, and the customer. So I think that um, that is extremely important to really build that connection by delivering great tasting product with 10% better service than your toughest competitor in an amazing environment. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, I would suspect that unlike what I've read about some of the Korean consumers, the U.S. consumer are very price sensitive. Uh, you know, they're always uh, you know, watching their, their, their pennies and their dollars, so to speak. And the other difference, uh, I think one would have to reflect very closely on if they're going to enter the U.S. market, is to look at the uh, difference between um, consumer, what consumers say with regard to the capital certifications and, and, and what kind of investment with regard to that. Uh, how that might be different from the actual behavior. What was your second question? But you know, 
like companies, I think industries can go through different life stages. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you look at a company, they often you know, begin as we would like as an infant, and then it moves into, as an infant, it's really helpless, and, and then you move into early childhood, and you're all over the place, and you have all sorts of things, and, and, and you're starting to see your first successes. And then one gets into adolescence, and some arrogance develops, and um, well, I don't know if you've ever met an arrogant or an adolescent that knows everything or had any children like that, but that starts to, to happen. And then we see chaos. One gets into early adulthood, and you start to see some structure. You start to see some balance. You start to see less chaos. But then what happens is an organization or an industry can move into old age. And then, of course, what happens, uh, I, I got to there, but what happens next is we die. So I think it's really important to look at your industry and try to keep it in that young adulthood area, which is probably where the Korean industry is now, and, and ensure that you don't move on to old age, and ensure that the industry doesn't die. One does that by thinking strategically, by staying in touch with and listening to consumers, or listen to your customers, and working together. You really have to have a, a united industry I strongly believe that one strong voice is better than many smaller voices, and I believe it's really important that uh, one watches what goes on from a government affairs perspective. You know, over-regulation is bad public policy, and you know, things really need to sort out in the private sector. Uh, so I think through good information, good market research, a strong government affairs work with United Vice, a United Voice, and thinking strategically, will keep your industry growing, it'll keep it vibrant, and you'll truly, truly be able to, to, to achieve uh, just incredible success and continued growth. And, um, and I hope you didn't fall asleep while I was talking. Thank you.